Welcome to Purdue University College of Science Superheroes of Science podcast. I'm Stephen. And I'm Sarah. We will be discussing anything and everything related to the science classroom and interviewing scientists. Because as we know, scientists are the superheroes behind the science. So join us as we learn about the scientists and explore current trends in K-12 science education. Welcome to Superheroes of Science. We're here today with John Reinstrakierkoff, Associate Professor of Practice for the Department of Chemistry. Welcome Hello. Hello. Right this time? Uh, it's real close. Reinstrakierkoff. Reinstrakierkoff. Yeah, the last part. Right. Just a tiny bit wrong. Okay. But only about 1% of people say my last name correctly. So. Okay. Yeah. How do you Believe get it or not, almost everyone says mine right. Well, yeah, yours is Steve pretty Smith. simple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they can call me Steve, they can call me Steven. I was going to say, I, I, I had not met you before until today, but I already knew how to pronounce your last name. Yes. Right. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, Reinstra Kirchhoff is too long and complicated for people to say, so um, all my students and pretty much all my colleagues call me RK or Dr. RK. Uh, I like yep. that. Yep. Nice. Yeah. Okay. That Makes it easy on simple-minded folks like me. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, we, go ahead. Guys, yeah, so we've asked you here. We're excited to know what associate professor of practice, what is your role with yeah. the Department of Chemistry? Yeah. So um, the uh, professor of practice role has a slightly different role than um, what a uh, traditional professor uh, line would be in a uh, department um, at a university. So uh, most of the time if you mention, hey, I'm a professor and I'm uh, you know, chemistry, biology, something in science, people get this idea that, oh, you, you must have this lab and you wear a lab coat and, you, and you're doing all this research and, you, and, you, and you're, you're discovering new things or making new things. Mm -hmm. And those are all really cool and important things. Um, I do not do that on that kind of scale. And the biggest difference is uh, at Purdue, um, most faculty will have that research lab and they'll have full-time graduate students, uh, a team of graduate students. Sometimes it's, it's three or four and sometimes it's, it can be quite a bit more uh, that work in their research group. And those, um, uh, those graduate students are doing day in and day out. They're spending 40, 50, maybe even more hours a week researching and working on their um, projects. And in my case, I do not have graduate students that work with me. Uh, I do a lot of teaching and some graduate students come and work with me on the teaching, but um, I do not have graduate students in a lab working on research projects. I still do some research. I do some uh, development of, um, of experiments and um, things that will work well for teaching. So mm -hmm. um, it, students in, in both high school and, and uh, even, even middle school, you, middle school students know this, high school students know this, you have these experiments your teacher gives you and they, hey, we're gonna do this today and you do this and, 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 you, and you learn something from those experiments. We want those kind of experiments to be things that are exciting, things that are fun, um, things that you learn from, and you say, now I understand science better because I did this experiment. And whether it's in junior high, whether it's in high school, or you're an undergraduate in college, and you're getting started in general chemistry or organic chemistry in college, you're gonna be doing experiments the whole time you're doing science. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where my interest is, is making those type of experiments, you can call them teaching experiments. I want to make those teaching experiments better, more fun, more interesting, and especially what I'm really interested in is, is technology. Can we make them high tech? And what can we do with technology that we couldn't do without the technology? So short answer is I do not have a team of graduate students working on new research, designing new things, or I instead, I have a, uh, some undergraduates, and I spend my time focusing on making better teaching experiments. That is really cool that there is someone out there helping, like, like what you're saying, working to almost update mm -hmm. the experiments that we've been doing. And, and, and sometimes that's what we do. We take an experiment that, hey, a, a, a college class or a high school class has been doing this kind of experiment for a long time. Are there things now that we can update, make it better? And there's a lot of updates. I'm, I'm, I mentioned technology is something I'm very interested in, and we can discuss that more sure. in a few minutes here. Um, but another aspect I'm very interested in is how can we make the experiments um, 
uh, more uh, environmentally friendly. Mm -hmm. So maybe an experiment that you might do at high school and you're like, wow, we have a lot of this leftover stuff that we're, it's waste and we're mm -hmm. throwing it in the garbage or it's pouring down the drain. Or maybe it's stuff we say, oh, the, my teacher said that this is bad to pour down the drain. And so we have to collect it in a bottle and, and it's waste and it's hazardous waste. How can we make that less and still do the same experiment um, that you can still learn the same things, mm -hmm. but now um, uh, it's, it's, it's more environmentally friendly, maybe safer to do in the lab, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So I'm also interested in those kind of improvements in teaching experiments as well. Those things we need to get to teachers so they know, because teachers want to know. That's, that's a need. Yes. Huge need. And um, to the students that might be listening to this, when you get an experiment from your teacher and you sit down and, and, you, and, you, and you, you work on it a little bit and that experiment has gone through a lot of work behind it that you don't realize. Yes. Someone designed that experiment, someone tested it, someone got it to the point to where maybe you have one hour or an hour and a half to get that experiment done they know it's going to be able to get done in that mm -hmm. amount of time. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of work behind the scenes to do that. And what I found, for example, I design mostly college level experiments, but some of them are, are also high school level experiments. And when I'm working with that, I have a student who can do research. They'll come in four to six hours a week for an entire semester just to develop one experiment that we think is now ready to be used. Wow. So one three-hour experiment has that much work behind it to really make sure it's good and it's going to work well. Because if you think about it, if your teacher gives you an experiment and it completely doesn't work, it's hard to learn some things from it. You can always learn why it didn't work, mm -hmm. but it's still you want the experiment to work and you say, oh, now I understand this piece of chemistry or this piece of biology or this piece of uh, physics or engineering or what, I understand it better because I saw an experiment and I saw this thing happen in my experiment yeah. and now I understand it. So we have to have them work. It, if people underestimate the amount of work that goes into this. Teachers don't because they do it. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I think it's so awesome. We have someone there helping and making and working on those. But I do want to back up to the technology. Because you said something I really liked. It, 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 it rang a, a happy bell. Because a lot of times people want to use technology just for technology's sake. You know, we preach against that. But you said uh, I, that you want to create things with technology that we could not do without it. Mm -hmm. And so what are some examples mm -hmm. of things that you are either have done recently or you're working on now, mm -hmm. that you're integrating, that your technology is being able to help us further education right. or right. understanding? Yeah. So um, I'll, give a, I'll give two examples that come to my mind right now, things that we've um, been working on. One is uh, a very simple example. We've been uh, working on uh, taking a lot of experiments and taking the probes and sensors that you use in the experiment. So this could be a thermometer, which um, would, might be called a temperature probe. Um, or a pH sensor, which we might call pH probe. So that's where we get that word probes from. Or sensors, um, we might have a pressure sensor. It's sensing the air pressure in the room or the pressure inside a particular container um, that has some gases in it. And we are working on what does it mean to when those pressure sensors are wireless and they send their data they collect without any wires over the, over the air to your computer or iPad or whatever um, device you have. Um, so it's, it's a wireless collection. It's, it's Bluetooth. It's, um, all the students will know about Bluetooth headphones, right? Yes, There's no wire connecting your headphones to your phone. But somehow the music is getting from your phone to the headphones, right? It's, it's being sent um, uh, via Bluetooth radio waves, okay? And uh, we're using that now with the probes and sensors. Now you might say, well, okay, but how does that any different than a one with a wire? Other than the, the wire is gone, but does it change the experiment? Sometimes it really doesn't change the experiment. But I'll mm -hmm. give you an idea of why that's important. read this interesting article about a doctor. And he was working with premature babies. So these are babies who are born um, before they were supposed to have been born. And so they're very tiny. They only weigh a few pounds. And the hospital has to measure things like the baby's heart rate 
and the baby's temperature. And so they would put these little sticky pad sensors on them to measure temperature and heart rate and things like that. And there would be all these wires coming off of this little tiny baby going to some sort of computer and the computer is recording this information. Well, if the baby moves, their hand can hit those wires and things like this. The ba- and it's hard to pick up and hold a baby. You know, these, these, these little premature babies, you want to hold and cuddle them and, and, and you can't when they're attached to all these wires. So the doctor realized, I can make these wireless and they'll just send their data without the wires. Mm-hmm. And now that baby, you can pick up the baby and the baby doesn't feel like it has these wires all attached to itself. And that just really struck me as that's so important mm-hmm. and that we can use that same technology. You gain some experience with it in real life when you're saying, I'm doing this experiment and I'm using a temperature probe or a pH probe and it's wireless and now I can move about and I have more freedom and I can do more with it because I don't have this wire holding my computer right next to it. And so that's just a a small example, but if you start learning these things now, maybe someday you'll be that doctor that has that idea, hey, if we do this, I can do something better Mm -hmm. than what what we've been able to do before. Uh, Another answer to your question is, Um, We use iPads a lot, and um, we use them for both a digital lab manual and an electronic lab notebook. And uh, so, um, again, students listening to this will know, hey, my teacher gives me a piece of paper, and it has the instructions for doing my experiment. And you know that somewhere your teacher took a piece of paper, and they put it on the copy machine, and they made... 20 or 30 copies and and handed it out to the class and everybody got a copy of that piece of paper. Now, what we're working on is the very best way is to put that on an iPad um, or a computer. And so when you're sitting there, you don't have to um, have a piece of paper. It's all right there. But then what we do is then as you're collecting your data, you're taught, hey, I need to write this data down. I need to um, take very careful notes about what I see, what I, what are my observations, what are my data that I'm collecting, and you're writing all this down. Well, now what we can do is, in addition to the instructions being digital, we write down all of our notes and observations. Our lab notebook is now digital. So we use uh, iPads, we use Apple Pencils, and we collect data that way, and the students and my labs are writing that down digitally. And where this makes a difference is in a couple things. So I mentioned these probes and sensors that are wireless and they're sending the data to your iPad. You now make a graph of say temperature over time, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. pH versus volume for a titration or um, whatever the experiment may be. That data is right there on the iPad you can actually take a screenshot of that data and put it right into your lab notebook. Yeah. You don't have to print anything out. You don't have to sketch or draw any. Your actual data is very easily inserted into your notebook. And then um, we work on electronic grading so the teachers can see, here's what my students did. That right there means you have better notebooks that the students did. You're better able to see as a teacher, did my students collect the right data? Did they get the right graph? That type of thing. Mm -hmm. Then this is the transformative part. We're doing this data collection on an iPad, which has a camera. At different steps away, we said, take a picture of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Set up this experiment, take a picture of it. Um, When you get the results and you've made this compound or you've discovered this new thing or you know your the, the car you built that was supposed to go down and went down you take a little movie of what you just did and you include that as part of your work so an interesting thing about this is if you go back into the um, 1980s and 90s and anytime earlier in fact when you wrote a science paper you always write the abstract which is the summary of the paper And in there, I remember being told an abstract must contain no pictures, no graphics, no, um, it's it's all words. And the reason was the journals didn't want to publish graphics. They didn't know what to do with it. If you put a picture or a graph or something in your abstract, they couldn't catalog it the correct way. 
Hmm. And so um, the abstract is supposed to be just words. Now that's changed. Now dr scientific journals are all digital and electronic, and it's almost a requirement for many journals that you must have a representative graph or, or picture or something of your experiment to include with your abstract for the paper that when someone looks at this one picture, says, oh, I get an idea of what this experiment was about. Mm -hmm. It's completely changed. And it used to be that journals and science would try to keep the graphics limited because they were expensive to print and you definitely didn't do any color ones. Now there's color photos all over the journals because it, the picture can sometimes communicate better than words mm -hmm. what you did in your experiment. Well, we need to teach those skills to students. So junior high, high school, college students need to start to learn, hey, what I'm doing in the lab, yes, I need to take careful notes and, and, and things. You still have to do those things, but now I can add in pictures of my actual work. Um, I can add in actual graphs that I collected, and it, you are now enhancing and improving um, the quality of your experiment and the notes you take on it. So how did you, I mean, being able to incorporate and put technology into a lab setting, how did you get excited about this? Yeah. Where did, where did this yeah. start with you? Right. Um, I think that goes all the way back to when I was a little kid. So I loved computers when I was a little kid. Um, and um, uh, I got a computer, I think I got my first computer when I was 10 years old. And, and, that, and that computer, um, nowadays your calculator that you buy from the store is more powerful yeah. than the computer I had. <laughs> and it, the computer didn't have a monitor or a screen. You had to plug it into your TV. And, and, um, uh, and, uh, and I got this book, well I would get these magazines in the mail, and they would have this computer code in a language called BASIC. And uh, it would have these, and it would have maybe 400 lines of code. You weren't looking mad mad. I, I was, I, no, but I was, I was typing it. You know, I remember one was like, if you type in all of these lines, and, and you don't make any mistakes, you can't even get a comma wrong or anything yeah. like that, right. but you type it all in, your computer will draw this beautiful picture of a turkey. And, and, and we would laugh nowadays because it wasn't even that beautiful picture of a turkey. Yeah, but it was like the Thanksgiving <laughs> issue, and you got this turkey, and we thought, oh, that's so cool. And, and um, I just was very interested in computers. But to me, they were a hobby. I didn't, you know, people didn't quite know what, what you could do with computers. Um, you know, and, and so I just kind of enjoyed them. But I also really liked science. I did a lot of science fair projects and things like that. So I would go through... Um, high school and and I like science and I kept learning about computers on my own and then I got to college and it was about my third year of college when I realized um, one of the faculty person says you know there's this whole part of chemistry called computational chemistry Whoa. you mean I can take computers <laughs> and chemistry and put them together I was so excited uh, and so I went to graduate school, and um, that's what I did was computational chemistry. Um, it's more broadly called theoretical chemistries, quantum chemistry. Um, you know, quantum chemistry is when you want to sound like you're super smart. You say, oh, I do quantum chemistry. Like, whoa, you must be really smart. And, you know, I had to study a lot of math and, and um, things like that. But my knowledge of computers helped me be a better chemist, a better scientist, and it helped me do that research. And then what happened was, towards the end of my graduate school work, when I was getting close to getting my PhD, I started to realize I really enjoy teaching things to people. And I had such a fun experience as an undergraduate um, in college that I realized I want to work with more undergraduates. That just feels right to me. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that's what I did. I went into teaching mm -hmm. um, rather than into research, which explains why we said a few minutes ago, I don't have a big research group with grad students. Not that I don't enjoy research, I enjoy teaching more. Yeah. And, um, and so for the last 20 some years, I've been teaching chemistry and I've never lost my love for computers and technology. And all those things I learned back about computers just kind of on my own and having fun with them back in um, you know, when I was starting when I was about 10 years old and going into junior high and, and high school, you know, I learned things about, like, what is RAM, you know, the memory mm -hmm. of the computer, and about the CPU, and about coding. And I'm not a very, you know, there's a lot about computers I don't know, but all those basic things that I learned 
still help me today. And so when we're trying to figure out how do I make an iPad work well, I need to know how is an iPad really working. I need to understand what is Bluetooth technology and, and, and how is the iPad storing the files and how is it connecting to the network and how are we doing these things to make these things work. And so I enjoy those kind of problems and I like to explore that so I can put these things together. And honestly, that's what makes me happy is that I'm doing things that I find very interesting and really cool. Nice. Um, nice. And, and I would just say broadly, that's what you want to do. Maybe you are not interested in computers, but maybe you're just really interested in um, the outdoors. You say, I love going on walks, and I love seeing trees and, and, and flowers and grasses grow and things like this. And, and then when I see a tree that looks like it has a disease, I, I, I'm interested, what, what is that disease and how might we fix it? And then you, you say, well, I also like science. And one of these days you're going to say, I can put those two together. And you're going to say, I can do science outside. <laughs> I can be a scientist and I get to go and, and hike in forests as part of my job. As a, and you put those two things together. Like, That's so cool. Um, or, or, you know, you may have something else that you like to say, oh, my, my, I love thinking about, um, uh, I love thinking about, um, uh, uh, you know, some, some piece of technology like cars. I really love cars and thinking about the different kinds of cars and how cool they are. And then someday you may say, but I also like science and I'm going to put them together. And the next thing you know, you might be a scientist trying to design a car that pollutes less or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's... Take the things that you're interested in, put it together with your science experiences, and you'll go a lot of places. I, again, I like that. I it, too. Just it's great advice. the thought of taking what you love and then seeing what you can do with it. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's what so many people are afraid to do because they don't realize they can make those connections. Yeah. And, and I would add that if you're doing things that are exciting to you, okay, mm -hmm. then those things will make you want to do more of it the next day. Yes. Um, it's not, I'm not saying I don't. There are days when I don't enjoy my job. Um, but most days I'm happy to do my job because yeah. it's fun stuff and it's things I like. And other people may say, I don't like what you do. And I'd say, well, but I don't necessarily enjoy what you do. <laughs> we all enjoy different things, but go with the things that you enjoy. If you try to force yourself into doing something that you don't enjoy, um, you're not going to be very motivated to, to do more of it. All right, let me throw another one at you. We're going to jump forward 50, 75 years. Mm -hmm. What's chemistry education going to look like then? Yeah. So, well, th this will be interesting. I mean, one thing that, that uh, there's a lot of people out there working on is uh, virtual labs. And these would be experiments that you can do. Um, and the computer, you kind of see it on the computer. Maybe you're even wearing some, uh, if you're thinking that far in the future, maybe you're wearing some goggles or something, and you're seeing this in 3D, a virtual reality lab. And there's a lot of neat things about that that I think are very interesting. I'm not sure that that, um, I'm skeptical sometimes because mm -hmm. I, I wonder, you still need some hands-on skills. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, for students who are listening to this, um, there's a reason why sometimes you're, you need to step away from your book and your teacher, your science teacher is saying, now we're going to do this experiment. The reason that is is because they want you actually touching things mm -hmm. and using instruments and learning how they work. And that will never fully go away. Um, there may be some things that you can see and learn and experience with a computer digitally, but you still need that real world stuff. And so part of what I was describing, I like to take the technology. I'm not opposed to it at all. I love it. But I also see the value of just being and doing things in right at, with your hands. Mm -hmm. And so if we can put the two together. And so another answer to your question is, um, and this is a, a field that, that is, I think will, will grow in time, is something called augmented reality. And this mm -hmm. is the idea that your phone or maybe even a set of glasses that you wear will display information on top of things that you see. So um, something that you're doing there, maybe the temperature is automatically just displayed right there and you kind of visually see it right in front of you. Um, that type of thing could be very interesting. Um, so we'll see where, where things like that go. Well, I like that idea. 
it, it's the, like the Bluetooth to the glasses. That's a neat idea. Yeah. yeah. It's just measuring it. That would be neat. It would be cool. Now, yeah. something I'm thinking as I'm listening to this. So do you have, how does it work with undergrads that come in and help you with these labs or if you're describing these labs or helping train these labs maybe to professors that want to update, want to use mm -hmm. a, a newer technology-based mm -hmm. thing, but they've always used paper. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that's something I'm thinking of. Every every class, we all, I would always hand out a paper copy of the lab. So I'm thinking, hmm, I would have to learn how to see this on my iPad. And that would be, a, for me, a challenge to then take notes Yep. not on paper. Sometimes I've heard people yep. say before, I need to see it on paper. I struggle to see it on a screen. And I think another part of that too is you can take the lab and get the data on the screen. But then I've heard teachers say before, but I like my students to make the graph themselves, to mm -hmm. not have the computer do the graph mm -hmm. for them. So I think what I'm trying to ask is, how have you had those questions come up with, with students, maybe work for you, yep. or people that you've trained that are used to paper and maybe are uncomfortable with switching to all right. digital? So um, I'll, I'll answer that in, in, in a couple different ways. The first thing is, in my labs that I've put together now where we are using this technology, we're 100% paperless. The students never have a single sheet of paper the entire lab from beginning of the semester to the end of the semester. But I think that that is a nice outcome of all the technology and work. That was not our goal. Our goal was not to design a paperless lab. Our goal was to make sure that, number one, the technology we put in didn't hurt learning. If you put technology in and the computer is doing everything for you, it's hurting your learning. Okay. okay? So that's our number one goal. We want to make sure it's the students are learning at least as much. And then if they can do some things that enhance their learning, such as making videos of something they did in the lab mm -hmm. that they couldn't do with pen and paper, now you've enhanced their learning. So that's a very important goal. So I totally agree and see where anybody who says any of the things you mentioned, oh, well, I think there's some things they can learn better on paper. I agree, we want to make sure we don't lose that when we introduce the technology. So let me give you a couple examples. We use iPads and we use the Apple Pencil or a stylus that the students can write with. Because the students have that, they can still make things by hand. They can still collect data and you can still tell them in this lab, you're gonna draw out the graph by hand yeah. okay. because it's important mm -hmm. to do. And I believe that's important to do because if you just let the computer do it, then they'll just assume computers can always, it's, it's like math and a calculator, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. When calculators first came out, a lot of math teachers were very wary, and I'm talking back in the 1950s, right? You know, the 60s. So uh, well, you got to learn how to do all this math in your head. Mm -hmm. And um, calculator, you know, we don't want that calculator. And people won't learn how to multiply 2 times 3 is 6 if, because they'll just always punch it into your calculator. Well, now most people who teach math, and virtually everyone, knows that, yes, we still have to teach that, but there are times when now the calculator allows us to do math that would be take too long to do otherwise yeah. or too hard to do otherwise, but we want the students to see, okay, you can do 2 times 3 equals 6, good, you understand that, but now how do you do 2,368 times 4,295? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, you could do that by hand, but it'd take a long time, so your calculator is a great tool to do that. That's the kind of thing we're interested in, in with the technology and, and science labs is still teach them how to do those basic skills, but now are there more things we can do with it? So we will have labs that do both. Labs that, even though it's still in a digital environment, they're learning some of those skills on their own first, and then they'll go and turn and say, okay, I just made this graph with 20 data points. But now I can use a computer and collect the same graph with 2,000 data points. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. And I understand what that 2,000 data point graph means because I understood it. I did one on my own with 20 data points. And so we're still very interested in those things. The other part to your question is you have to go slow. Um, okay. We have a lab like I just described. It's entirely paperless. I wouldn't expect any teacher, college, high school, junior high teacher to come out and say, oh, 
I can just take these iPads and, and overnight, instantly, all the paper will be gone. <laughs> you have to start slow. <laughs> and you start with a couple simple things. And you're like, okay, I'm going to learn because you have to learn a little bit how to do some of this. Um, it's quite simple in some ways. But until you get used to the new ways of doing things yourselves, um, as a teacher, it's going to be hard to just give it to your students and expect that they'll know how to do it. Okay. Well, John, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. We really appreciate your insights today. This has been good. Yeah, it's been fun to talk about. Anytime. Thank you for listening to our podcast. If you love superheroes of science, be sure to subscribe, rate, and give a review on iTunes or your preferred podcast player. Be sure to join us as we add interviews of scientists and incorporate discussions of current trends in K-12 science. Until next time, be super and remember, you are someone's hero. Boiler up. Hammer down. <laughs>